thank you very much for uh, inviting me and giving me this opportunity to present something I've been working on for some time now. Uh, thanks. I actually will try to uh, do it in 20 minutes, although there's a lot I want to say, because what I tried to do is to actually put together a presentation that combines uh, some of my activities. They have to do with uh, research, teaching, writing, uh, design as well. Um, I hope it will make sense to you. So I gave it a few themes or keywords. The identity trap, first. When uh, you visit this building in Mishrif, Lebanon, uh, obviously you may think it has been there for at least 80 to 100 years. It is actually the renovation of a building that stood there in the 1960s. And it was simply transformed, I would argue disfigured, and Lebanonized in a way. It was given a fake identity. This was the original building of the 1960s that actually I could not find when I went to try to find it. And I discovered uh, when somebody told me that, yes, yes, it was here on the same site. I thought it was demolished completely and rebuilt. It was actually simply dressed with what you saw before. Here you have another case. You have uh, on the top part of the photograph a building that is nowadays a restaurant. And it was also uh, the transformation of a very elegant building of the 60s that was the Arts and Crafts Pavilion that you see here. So here again, we're talking about the same building and what happened to it. This was the arts and crafts showroom in Beirut in the 60s. If you look to the right, you have the current version of the Hotel Phoenicia that is dressed with the neoclassic capitals and you have also neoclassical arches behind to give a sense of tradition somehow because there is a Lebanese restaurant behind, so if you cannot have a good shawarma, if you don't have anything historic in the, in the, in the setting. And to the left you have the, the, the actual original slender columns of the Hotel Phoenicia. Again, to the right you have the current condition of the uh, presidential palace in Baghda that was again Lebanonized as if you would not guess what you, where you're going if you arrive to that door. You need to know that you are in Lebanon. Uh, and actually the original building is to the left. It was an extremely interesting building that spread on the crest of a hill with open views that represented uh, the Lebanon of the time. We're talking about the 50s. You get the picture already. I will show just a few like that. You have uh, two buildings, one of the 2000s in Hamra, that refers to nothing that has to do with it, around it. And you have a normal mundane building of the 50s that makes sense. Is this tradition? Is this local? Is this modern? So you see my point. There is a lot of confusion about what identity is about. And with reconstruction, we have projects like this, where the Grand Théâtre, with all its amazing activities and its elegance as well, is going to be transformed into a boutique hotel. You also have the demolition of hundreds, if not thousands, of buildings, like the Hotel Carlton. You have the transformation of structures, avant-garde structures, I would say, like this one, which was the city center cinema, that is awaiting for more transformation. Just a word about modernism. What is modernism? According to Marshall Berman, the sparsest and most abstract modes of modernism can set us free from lies and give us space to make a fresh start so we can at least try to construct personal and public lives we don't have to be ashamed of. This is the starting point of most of what I do. A quick survey, of course this is not a lecture about architecture, but I need to show you very briefly, I try to choose uh, the images that make uh, my point. A very quick survey by let's say every 25 years of every 15 years of how we could look at history of architecture because I argue that what we call tradition today is actually centuries of modernisms compiled across time. 
So it's absolutely wrong to take tradition as something that came to us, that is a given. It is actually something that has been transformed. Uh, and if we look at modernism today as one of those stages, then we do not see the contradiction between learning from tradition and being modern. And I hope this will be clear in the last part of the lecture. So you have the vernacular architecture, very simple. You have the Lebanese, what you call the Lebanese house, that is actually a regional house, but we're, we're, the Lebanese are very proud of it, and they call it the Lebanese house. It is a central hall that distributes. This is a version in the mountains of the late 19th century with the large openings in the middle. You also have the city version of it or the urban version. And you see that the, the openings testify to the actual functions behind. You see it evolving, like uh, I argue it is like a Darwinian evolution of the species because you don't have any more a garden in front of the house, you have a house facing you at six or seven meters across the street. So this triple bay is still there for the vocabulary, but it doesn't serve its purpose anymore. Hence, it is like, uh, it, it's like a nose that becomes longer in order to perform something. So you have the, the sides, you have the openings on the side here that uh, have a view across the street, 100 meters away. You have the advent of technologies, concrete transformations, but still the spirit is the same. You have versions of this in the 30s, 1950s, late Bauhaus, I would say. Even when there was a reference to traditional architecture, and although in this case we do have traditional forms uh, in arches, yet the most interesting part of this project inside of Ayasim Salam is the actual courtyards. So it is more the performance of architecture than the actual looks of it. And there have been a lot of demolitions. This is a house of the 1970s by architect Khalil Khouri, demolished. This was the interior. So every level, it's a split level that uh, continued outside generously. Experimentation also is threatened. This is abandoned, will probably be demolished research. When I was writing my, oh, 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 never mind. When I was writing my dissertation, I was always surprised to see people telling me that they, had I come one year earlier, uh, I would have found seven beautiful boxes of drawings, but they were full of cockroaches and dust. So people were throwing the archives, nobody was collecting anything. So years later, after a lot of effort, we were able to start actually a center in Beirut, which is the Arab Center for Architecture. Why Arab? Because I think the same issues concern all of us. And it's true that it's starting in Beirut, but uh, there is hope and it has actually started to spread. And I'm sure there are other initiatives that I do not know of, and this is why I'm very happy to be here. I think we will connect with people. So this center collects books, magazines, research, papers, and actual drawings. So we started, we, we actually had a funding from the European Union and the Heinrich Böll Foundation, and we did a pool of associations with uh, Arab, who collect music, with the Arab Image Foundation, they collect photography, and the Cinémathèque de Tanger in Morocco, they collect films. So the idea is that modern heritage is also heritage. We do regional meetings, national meetings. This is one of them. I hope the link to the website will, will work. So I invite you to visit uh, that website. It has, oops, sorry. I don't know what's happening. Maybe I have to... Let me try once again. Otherwise you have the, the web link here, modernheritageobservatory.org. It is full of information. We have around uh, 60 associations connected to us across the region. Uh, what ties all these people together is that they are all working in the archiving field of culture, arts, mostly late 19th and 20th century. So there is a lot happening that we didn't even know about. I'm sorry about the link, I suspect you can, you can visit the site. 
Uh, later, sorry. Hmm. Okay, by the time it, uh, it works, I brought with me uh, what we produced recently, and I would like to offer it to you, Hassan. It, uh, it is the publication that we did together with this group, the Modern Heritage uh, Observatory. We called it the Modern Heritage Observer, Rasid al Turath al Hadith. And uh, please, my pleasure. And we produced uh, with the Arab Center for Architecture a set of postcards that I will show when the computer will allow me to do that. <laughs> okay, it's Thank a pleasure. You. It's a pleasure. Uh, maybe I need a technician here. I don't know what's happening. It is still searching for the link and I cannot yeah, probably the freeze it. Connection. Okay, but I cannot even get out of that link. Yeah. I do not regret the time of uh, the days of slides, but... Uh, I'm not sure how it works. Yeah, I don't know. There was somebody who was helping before. I don't know. Do you have an idea on how to do this? Because I really wanted to show you more things. Oof. Restart. No, wait. I am really sorry. Should work in a second, I think. Come on. Try escaping. Okay, I will continue without without the images. I really want to show a few things, mostly teaching. So what I'm trying to do is to actually combine research, serious, thorough research, along with operative action on the ground. Because I do believe in operative research. I do believe that all the effort put in universities, with all these uh, doctor researchers, even at master's levels, I think a lot of interesting things are happening and they practically have absolutely no influence on the ground and our cities are being built. The problems are the same in all the countries around us. The misapprehension about what modernism is about in arts, in architecture, maybe in architecture it's even more visible. Uh, I try also to do the same in design when possible, which is to try to think of performance rather than style. In teaching at AUB, most of the studios that myself and others teach have to do with adaptive reuse because we do think that sustainable design is important but sustainable design is not about the high-tech facade it has to do with under understanding the issues at stake here and now and therefore adapting certain buildings to new uses is I would argue a very strong asset okay it works thank you very much I will try to go faster because we lost some time. So this is the magazine that we produced together as a collective, the Modern Heritage Observer. You can soon find it uh, in PDF on the, on the actual website. Uh, dissemination is very important through posters, through lectures. This is, for example, a poster that is some sort of mosaic of 40 years of architecture in Lebanon. So you have a timeline going from 1940 to 75, and you have important buildings uh, by program. Uh, we organize poster exhibitions, and poster exhibitions are not only about images of architecture, but about the background and about the discussions that happened at the time, like uh, paper clippings. We did recently an exhibition in Beirut. This is when we produced those postcards. An exhibition of uh, original drawings and models. This, for example, was the, 
I would argue, the most important piece. It is simply a student training report of 1942. And it is the only document we have about a great house that was, not only the house was demolished, but there are no documents about it, except this you know, diligent student having a 90-page thorough uh, report about it. So we know everything about the construction of the time, the type of postcards we produced, there are 16 of them, design. This is, of course, a blunt putting together of an existing structure and an addition to it. But the idea was to respect the existing house, not necessarily to mimic it, but learn from it. So it sits respectfully and modestly next to it. And the space in between becomes a Liwen, which is a traditional open space that is covered, it's like a porch. This is what we call it in Lebanon. You would find it in different other namings. Some people call it E1, some people call it D1. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's also something we, we started to work on, which is a lexicon of construction terms in Arabic, because each country has their own. And I think it's interesting to, to work on that. So here you have um, a descendant, if you want, or a cousin of the existing one. And the old facade becomes actually uh, a facade inside the house. So it incorporates the old. And the upper mezzanine overlooks at the same time the, the old space and the garden. And we were happy to be given also to landscape the garden the way we actually wanted. So this openness of traditional house to the outside is extremely important. This is another case. You have here a traditional house, triple, uh, triple arch central hall, and we were asked to design a villa in here. And the big question was, what style will it be? And actually, we didn't actually care about the style. We, again, wanted to work with performance. So this house learns from the old one that is next to it. It takes from it things like orientation, ventilation, proper sun orientation, relation to the garden. The material is the same. It's the sandstone, but it's treated differently. And actually, they communicate together as well. So this is the, the house. We would like to call it a Lebanese house, simply to irritate those who think that Lebanese necessarily would mean red tiles, triple arches, and, and what have you. We think it is Lebanese because it was designed for Lebanese clients, following the bil Lebanese building code, located in Lebanon. Now, whether the architects are Lebanese or not does not matter nowadays. So this is a view from the old house towards the new. And it is actually inserted and it tries to keep the existing trees, most of them at least. The interior is extremely contemporary or modern, if you like. It has a courtyard because it makes sense to have it in this site. The site is not very big. It doesn't have a view. So the courtyard is not, again, a stylistic reference, it is actually, it performs what it needs to perform in here. And it is the most pleasurable place in the house. And those are two perpendicular views showing the openness to outside. This is another house that just finished. Um, the building code of the area forced us to have tiles and stone and we did not again want to replicate anything that existed. So we actually twisted the house so that it looks like a cluster of things and we do have red tiles but we don't see them from below. We prefer to have these overhangs that actually protect the walls. This is the way you see the house as you arrive from the top. Those photos are quite recent. This is the way you arrive. And then when you open the door, you have a view to the, to the sea. This is the site. So the openings are actually straightforward from the actual need. They do not follow any composition of any sort. Research. We do at AUB, and I sh I'm sure here you do it, and in many schools, students are invited to survey buildings in order to learn about uh, you know, building, but also about traditions. And actually, we moved in the last years from traditional architecture to more contemporary times. So we don't only survey traditional architecture. This is, for example, a survey on Kessin, a village. This, this is an uh, early 20th century house. This is the 1930s in another year. And this is, for example, the buildings of Ras Beirut or Hamra, for those who know it. So we actually do survey uh, modern buildings. And we do outings. It's very important. This is the 
معرض طرابلس الدولي of the Tripoli Fair by Oscar Niemeyer. And one of the projects we did with the students is actually to revisit the fair. And this is a seven meter long model and each student had to do a pavilion inside the fair designed by Oscar Niemeyer. We also in adaptive reuse did a studio on a whole uh, neighborhood of Beirut called Zarif. We called it the city on itself. So we accept densification, but it depends how you do it. This is the neighborhood. We studied with the students the actual morphology of the city, the building age. And for example, this student will build behind these three buildings that he decided to keep. And each student who wanted to demolish any building because they were working at the block level, they had to make a case for any demolishing. And in this case, the idea was not to demolish, but to accept a building of a higher, um, a higher building in the back and actually learn from these stairs that you find between those buildings. So you end up having a tower in the back, but that is actually cut and carved so that its impact on the street is lessened, but you do accept density. So this is uh, some sort of montage, whereby two floors are added to the existing building, and the tower is behind, and the kind of outdoor circulation is also learned from. This is another more experimental, uh, I would say, or progressive design, keeping the buildings and building on top of them with a structure that is actually placed inside the buildings. This is a recent project, a final year project by a student who transforms Hotel Saint Georges, for those who know it, into a art therapy center. And next year's, next semester's project would be the adaptive reuse of seven huge tobacco factories because they are starting to stop actually one after the other, stop uh, producing tobacco. And the idea is to um, catch up very quickly and propose something to the government before they start, you know, either demolishing them or transforming them into something that will not be actually useful. So the students will go and survey the needs of the seven different towns and they will devise a program and the proje project would consist of uh, adapting those buildings that are actually extremely interesting in, the, in their shapes. Thank you.